let's get into the basic uh, overview of how you would go about doing this, right? So you're going from assuming a, a black box or even a bit of a gray box environment, right? Something that would be typical for a pen testing scenario on the job. And you need to go from that to at least finding vulnerabilities. I wouldn't necessarily say you have to get a shell uh, if we're talking about a real world job scenario as a pen tester. If you're a red teamer, you're probably going to be getting more shells and really testing, okay, after I get the shell, can they detect me and uh, can I pivot around the network and stay undetected by both antivirus and the blue team and things like that? But as a pen tester, we're really, rather than the, the process and the detection and all that, we're really more focused on the technology itself. Is there any vulnerabilities in the technology? And this could be code, custom code or you know third-party code, any kind of web application stuff. It could be a service running on the server, uh, a network protocol that's being used that is not secured. Anything like that is along the lines, like think along the lines of the technology itself. That is what you're testing uh, to make sure it's secure as a pen tester. And so if we just dive in here really quickly, I'm going to outline for you guys the basic process, assuming you're in a pen testing role, right? So the very first thing that you're going to start off with is, and you've probably heard this term before, is information gathering. And looks like I'm going to need to make this uh, even larger font than it already was. So let's try 36. And uh, I don't really like how that wrapped, but oh well. So information gathering, this is kind of like your first step. Now, with information gathering, there's two types, really. There's uh, there's passive information gathering, and there's active uh, information gathering. So what's the difference, basically? With passive information gathering, you are basically, you're not leaving any kind of footprint, any kind of trace when you're doing uh, your info gathering. So what this could mean is you look for... Example for you look through social media, find email addresses out there by Google searching or using Google dorks, which are basically advanced searching functionality within Google. Uh, anything that doesn't touch the server, if you gather any information by visiting their website, that would technically be considered active information gathering because you're actually touching their server. You're leaving a, a bit of a footprint, if you will. I mean, you're not Still, you're not doing anything intrusive necessarily, but you are leaving a, a footprint there. So that is considered active. But if you're looking for information out there on the internet by like Google search or whatever search engine, DuckDuckGo, whatever you prefer, and you're not actually visiting any sites owned by them, yeah, that is considered passive information gathering. But I want to make a special note because I feel like this is not very often get talked about. But in a scenario where you're working for a company and you're pen testing their environment, right? A lot of times, a very key part to the information gathering process is that you'll actually have some data that you can leverage, right? Maybe it's previous scans that have been done, previous pen tests that have been done. And that's all very important information and it's going to save you a lot of time if that information is available to you, right? Because one of the big constraints, especially as pen testers, you know, we're, you know, the developers that we are, you know, testing their code where we're trying to break their, their code and things like that. They're on a really tight deadline to push their code into production and things like that. So we don't have the time that an advanced persistent threat actor does where they can just search forever and ever and ever looking for these vulnerabilities and finding things. So we need to take advantage of all of the ways that we can uh, make our testing more efficient. And one key way is to leverage previous findings and things like that. It can, a lot of times it can kind of point you in the direction of where you should be spending the majority of your time, where you should be looking. And this is a nice advantage that someone that's coming from a complete black box scenario, like an advanced persistent threat actor would they wouldn't have access to this information. So by all means, you need to leverage uh, any kind of data that you can get from your company that could help you uh, in testing this stuff. Now, of course, active is like, you know, you're leaving a trace, like maybe you're looking for information on their website. 
uh, running nmap scans against servers, which basically nmap is a tool that allows you to scan the ports and basically see what services are running on the server, right? You, you know, the websites that you see on the internet, you know, there's some kind of server that is hosting that website and that server may very well have some other services that are also running on it. And one of those services might be vulnerable to an attack and allow you uh, a way in. So with that being said, the next part of the process is what I would call enumeration. And this is a pretty big all encompassing thing, right? In the information gathering phase, right? In a pen testing scenario, you're not going to really spend as much time, typically, from my experience, on the passive side. Uh, you don't really care about people's emails unless unless you can run a basic password attack and uh, maybe get in. Now, keep in mind with password attacks, you don't want to lock out the accounts by too many failed attempts, but maybe you, that's within scope. It really depends on your company, what's in scope, what's not in scope, but most likely you're going to be spending the majority of your information gathering time doing the active info gathering. And once you've completed that, you know, okay, here's what services are running on the server. Here's what technologies it's using, things like that. Now you can jump into the enumeration part. And basically enumeration is just trying to find out as much information as possible uh, based off of what you found in the first step. So for example, right, in your information gathering phase, let's say you identified that uh, there is FTP running on the server. Well, the enumeration part is, okay, can I, what can I do with the FTP service? Can I log in with uh, anonymous access using username anonymous, password anonymous. And, uh, you know, are there some tools that I can run against the FTP service that could give me more information about the system, right? Can I maybe read some files on the server? Can I put some files on the server? What can I do? Okay, I see that there is a web server running on port 443. You know, what functionality is available in that on that website, right? Can I upload files? Uh, what kinds of files can I upload? Can I, and I mean, this is honestly, there's endless, endless questions you can ask. And really, this is one of the most meaty sections of what will make you a really good pen tester, right? Uh, honestly, there's always new technologies coming out all the time and how you enumerate those technologies always different, right? Depending on what the functionality of the technology is, how it actually works under the hood. And this is also what gives so much depth to this job, right? There's endless amounts of things that you can learn and ways that you can grow your skill set and bring value to a security team. And so this section is really huge. I just want to give you guys some examples. I don't want to get too in the weeds with the numeration because it really depends, 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 right? Depends on the service that's running as far as what you do to enumerate that service. And then based off of those results will depend on where you go from there. But if we, if we assume that you did pretty thorough enumeration and you identified a potential exploit, then the next step of the process is exploitation, okay? So let's say, hey, we identified that uh, the SMB service was running up here and we did some enumeration on it and we were able to identify the underlying operating system by leveraging the SMB protocol. And we found out that uh, it is an old Windows version that is vulnerable to, I don't know, Windows Eternal Blue exploit. Okay, so we've identified the exploit. Now we can go ahead and run that exploit. And going off of the examples that we've been giving thus far, assuming that we're starting from, you know, not knowing anything about the server or knowing very little to getting access, right? Depending on the scope of your job, you might actually stop here. Here's where it really depends. Do, does the company want you to actually get shells on the system? This is important to know because some companies, they might only want you to identify uh, the exploits and... I mean, get a shell to, you can get a shell in most cases to prove that uh, it is exploitable, 
But you got to be careful with your exploits. You don't want anything that's going to be a denial of service and bring stuff down. Now, typically, you are testing a pre-prod environment, not the production server. So something to keep in mind there as well. So what do I mean by that, right? This is a beginner video here. Well, as part of the development process, and if they're not doing this, they're really screwing up. But every company, what they should be doing is they should have a production environment, and that's the environment that all the users can see, right? Say Google.com, right? You go to Google, you see their production website, Google.com, right? But they also have non-production servers that they use for, for testing. So they put a change, they push a change out there. They have it in their test environment or their pre-prod environment. And they, they can test out their changes before they make it go live essentially, right? By pushing it into production. So you want to be testing the pre-prod environment. That way, if you do happen to bring something down, it won't be as won't be super costly, right? Like imagine Google's production stuff goes down. Obviously, this can be bad for the company, right? So you always want to be uh, testing a non-prod environment. So assuming that you are, you want to, you've identified a, poten a potential exploit, you still want to make sure that it's not a denial of service exploit or that, you know, that uh, even if it's not a denial of service ex exploit, you want to make sure that, uh, you're not going to bring anything down. And if, if you are that, uh, it's not going to have like, like terrible consequences for the company. Right. Obviously. So assuming everything's in a row there, you want to go ahead and try to run this exploit. Uh, and that way you can prove that it is exploitable. And then from there, it's very easy to say, you know, I got access here and, uh, this is the level of access I had. So therefore an attacker could leverage this to do this, this, and this. And when you're reporting it, which we'll get to in a bit, then this will give you a lot of, uh, a lot of information here, right? So for example, say we exploit that SMB vulnerability and we got initial shell on the system and we're able to run, you know, commands on the underlying operating system. Obviously that's a pretty big deal, right? That's a RCE remote code execution vulnerability. So now here's where, depending on the company, you might need to stop there. But if it's in scope to keep going, keep going, right? Let's say you get that initial shell and you're just a user level account. This is where privilege escalation uh, comes into play. And basically what privilege escalation is, and it can also exist before you get your, your shell, right? It could exist in the context of a web application, right? I am a basic user on this website. I can escalate my privileges to an admin user on the website. So I want to kind of emphasize and reiterate that this is not exclusive to after you exploit it necessarily, but commonly in this space, when we talk about privilege escalation, what we're talking about is we have an initial shell on the system. And what I mean by initial shell is that we've exploited some kind of piece of technology that has to do with the server or whatever. And it's allowing us to run commands on the underlying server. However, we are not running commands as the highest level user, right? We're, we're like a ba more basic level of, uh, the account that we're running commands as is a more basic user. And we want to go from that basic user to the root user or if you're talking about Windows, the NT authority system, right? So the way we do that, the process we go about doing that is known as privilege escalation. And so even within here, it's pretty much the same as the previous steps, how you go about doing that, I would say. So within that, you pretty much have more information gathering, okay? You want to find out you know, what's, what uh, processes are running on the server? You know, what level of permissions do they have? My user account, do I have any special privileges, right? Am I able to read or write certain files I shouldn't be able to, right? There's any set UID, set GID if we're dealing with Linux, you know, is the server completely patched, right? There's all this information gathering that you're now doing on the underlying server, and once you find out certain things, then you need to enumerate that. Like, okay, I am able to run uh, some special uh, 
commands as the root user. Let me enumerate further. Can any of those commands be used to escalate my privileges, right? That's the enumeration part. And then, of course, the exploitation as well. And that is what's going to give you the root access. Now, when we're really talking about penetration testing, we really don't need to go beyond this. Now, as a red teamer, they need to they might need to concern themselves with persistence and pivoting to other systems and, you know, getting their, uh, getting their agents on the box. If they're doing some kind of, uh, you know, C2 framework connecting to their C2 server, all that stuff. We don't have to worry about that as pen testers really. And even the way they go about it, they're probably doing a different way. Normally they're doing some social engineering, some easier ways to get in rather than trying to look for vulnerabilities and exploit them in technology. They're probably going to exploit uh, people through social engineering and stuff, like I said. So to really keep this focused in on pen testing, this is kind of what the framework is going to look like basically. And there's one last, there's one last thing I'd close off with and that's reporting, Right. After you're done with this whole process, you're going to need to write a report. I'm not going to cover that in this video. It's a pretty, it's a whole nother video in itself, but yeah, you're going to have to write up a report and explain both to high level executives and the technical people what the issue is and how they can mitigate it. So hopefully this was of help. This is a kind of lengthy video, but I hope it gave you a basic overview. It's really difficult for someone like me to break things down for a complete beginner. So please let me know if there's anything that I said in this video that didn't make sense to you. Maybe I was using too much jargon, too much terminology, and you really need me to break it down and explain what I'm talking about. If Chances are, if you have that question, some other people are going to also have that question. So please let me know if there's anything like that uh, down in the comments section below. And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Welcome to Elevate Cyber. We're going to be doing a lot of content like this. Um, so uh, and hit the like button as well to help get the message out there, of course, of course. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Uh, on screen now will be the playlist to keep going if there's anything else out at the time of watching this. So thanks for watching. I'll see you right over there.